All right. And it looks like we are actually recording, which means that part three of the anti scene bass player summit is now in full effect. If you're watching this, that means you are most likely live yourself on the anti scene Facebook page, but we are pre recorded for your entertainment pleasure. We are John Bowman. Former Hello. anti, hey, there he is. <laughs> Former anti scene bass player, current anti scene mixologist, mastering engineer, and general audio dude. And myself, Malcolm Tent, the current anti scene bass player and minister of propaganda. So, uh, yeah, man, if you guys have seen the past two episodes we did of this, we've been getting deep into the new blood era of the almighty anti-scene and everything that led up to it and now everything that's sort of come out of it. So by all means, take a look at the past two episodes we did, get the backstory. And so that way you'll know just what the heck it is we're talking about here and now in the present tense. So Mr. Bowman, speak, yes. to, <laughs> speak to us, tell us something, man. Where are we at? Where are we at in the story? Well, I think we kind of left off with uh, how my time in the band ended. You know, just a, a short recap. It was just kind of one of them life's changing on me quick things. And, you know, I was also kind of fizzling out a little bit, you know. And, and it had something to do with it. And other was just, you know, other things. But so I make this transition eventually to being from being in the band to not being in the band and not doing anything with the band for a minute to being the mixing engineer. And uh, even that transition was a little bit gradual because the first really serious recording, make sure I got this right, which is this one, a split with he who cannot be named from the dwarves. Mm. I actually did record this and my brother helped Jordan Bowman. He uh, helped engineer. He, he was the drum tech and he helped with some other things. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, this was their anti scenes first recording with the Gooch. Ah, uh, yes. Which is very interesting because he has a unique drumming style. I don't, I've seen some similar drumming styles before, but nothing quite like him. No. And he, he is fantastic. I mean, I can't, yeah, I, I, I was always thrilled to see him play because, and if, if, if you're unfortunate and, and missed it, anybody out there, most drummers, if they're right-handed, they'll ride the cymbals with the right hand and hit the snare with the left hand. But Gooch, if he was going to ride the hi-hat, his left hand would ride the hi-hat and his right hand would beat the snare. And then if he goes over to the ride, it switches his right hand beats the ride and then his left hand hits the snare yeah. and it's just all seamless. It's just ambidextrous bombastic. And then his parts are very uh, creative and very like um, they fit the songs really well, but they're also had this like cool classic rock thing going on. I always thought like the, the, the more, uh, you know, some of the intricacies you'll find in, in classic rock, you don't, you don't normally find in the punk rock, but he had it going on. So that was fun. Now recording him that, and Barry will tell you the same. It presented some challenges. Sometimes that whole ambidextrous thing could be really, really hard to, to get on a, a recording and get it very balanced, you know, but it was still great. And, and we, and we would get there. We would get there. Cause it I would be imagine tough. not, not to, to don't step on you, but, um, if a guy is playing the snare with one hand and then the other, I would tend to think there'd be a volume difference from one yeah. hand to the other. Yeah, there, there, there would be. And it's, it's the kind of volume difference where if you're in the room with it or it's live, you'd never notice. Mm -hmm. But when there's a microphone that close from the snare, you know, to the snare head, you'll notice on the recording and you've got to, you've got to work with that. You know, you might have to ride the faders a little bit, so do some automation or, compression alone might handle it it just depends on the song and and what's going on but I, I knew that would be a challenge so i brought my brother along and he helped he was a really big help right on and, um, i guess that would actually that would apply to everything too when you think about it like everything that he's playing with either hand is going to be 
like a different volume right across the whole board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it could be. Yeah. Most of the time it was, it was pretty consistent, but there were times where it was, it was just a a bit much, you know, Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this, this record came out of that, that session. This was recorded at Tremont music hall before it closed. Mm. Gooch is on the stage and recorded the drums up there. And then the, uh, other amplifiers were down on the, um, the floor. And this was over on the small side, what they used to call the Casbah. Mm-hmm. Before I go any further, I'd like to point this art here is fantastic. I love this art on both sides. That's Ryan Gilligan. He uh, oh. does these paintings in blood, which is amazing. And I believe Jeff's may have been done with Jeff's own blood. I know there's a, there's a portrait of Joe Young that was done after Joe passed. That's in Jeff's blood, which wow. is really awesome. And then he who could not be named got the same treatment on the back. And nice. the, my favorite song he ever did is on this called better than you. That's my, that's my theme song. Anytime I'm hating on the world, <laughs> you know, and think that I've got it all figured out. And nobody else does. I just turn on better than you. And that's how I make myself feel better. Sounds good to me. <laughs> and I, I believe this was Russ's first, first recording with Ann I seen as oh, a, wow. as a guitar player. I, I don't remember if Russ was ever, there's so much guest things that went on when we would record that, um, you know, some of them would go uncredited, you know, and it might be just somebody helping with the backup vocals or something, but, but I think this is Russ's first guitar de- debut. Wow. And this is a, fi- a fantastic seven inch if you can get a hold of it. Yeah, I know. I don't have one in my collection. I got to add that one to the list. God damn. What so, uh, this is a Rusty Knuckles release. Oh, mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and I seen songs, Let the Working Man Rest a Little Bit, which ended up on an, an album later. And then, If I Had a Thousand Dollars. Now, this is a good little piece of history here. This song, If I Had a Thousand Dollars, is a rupture song. Hmm. When. Jeff and I recorded that Rupture album. That's one of the songs Jeff did. And we thought that was one of the funniest songs. Just the song is, if I had $1,000, I'd be a millionaire. And it's up to the listener to figure out what that means. Like, is this some poor fool that thinks if he had $1,000, like he doesn't understand the concept of what a millionaire is? Yeah, or is it yeah. somebody that's like just a thousand dollars away? I'm just a thousand dollars away. Like, <laughs> if I had a thousand dollars, I'd be over that line, you know. So uh-huh. it's just it's so simple and so entertaining. So that song was done for Rupture. Then that was one of the songs on the Mongrels EP. Uh-huh. Jeff did it there, uh-huh. and then he did it. Now. I mean, that's that's how fun he is of this song. And, and I'd like to say that I am too. I love it. It's one of my favorite. And every version is great and has its own merits. It's I could listen to all three right in a row and not get tired of it. Either. Yeah, <laughs> It's really great. Good companion piece too. If I had a million bucks as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I forget really? about that song. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like, I think what 20, 25 seconds long, I think uh, from the EP royalty. For anybody who's got long memories or is, you know, got the EP royalty reissue, you'll recognize that one. So I, I was real pleased with this and, and I was happy to be back, back like a, you know, part of the action, but in, in a way that suited me better, you mm-hmm. know, because I mean, like I was saying last time, I, I loved being in the band. It was great. It was an awesome opportunity. I was always totally thrilled that I didn't bark up Jeff and Joe's tree, but was you know, found and considered, you know, and then I had people putting bugs in Jeff's ear, you know, about, about me. It was awesome, you know, and I had, I did, I had a great time, but it, you know, it soured and most of it had to do with me and, uh, personal changes and just, you know, also that feeling like I was talking about last time, I always felt I was riding on their coattails a little bit. I need, I really needed to have a little more time and, you know, space to express my own things a little bit, you know, my own musical endeavors a little bit and feel a little more secure not just feel like yeah i got i got on someone else's train you know but this is perfect because i still get to be a part of the action and make records with my friends you know and and then have that other freedom you know to do the things that i feel like i need to do otherwise you might as well mention that other band in question that you're still in and is still very active to this day i didn't pull my record out this time but i will that's war boys u.s war boys us that's 
um, myself, of course, Brian Smallwood, who was previously in the flat tires, Brandon Smallwood, his brother, who was previously in the flat tires, and my brother Jordan, who right before the flat tires came to an end or a long hiatus or, or whatever they, they are, which I've never been sure, was their, their, their final drummer. So, uh, and uh, I hate to say my brother's kind of on his way out due to health reasons, but, and that's been a hard thing. It's kind of obvious to us all, but we just, none of us can seem to just push the button and say it's final, but it, it's, it's about, you know, it's coming. Yeah, you know, I guess it'll, it'll come the day we find the person who, you know, takes, takes his place, but we want to keep him, we want to keep him involved because he is a fantastic artist and he has a good ear for, um, recording and mixing music as well. Um, he doesn't do as much of it as me, but he he has a good insight. He has a good uh, instinct about it, and he, he's very helpful. You know, he, he's a good mix checker for me a lot of times too. He helps me a lot with that kind mm-hmm. of thing. So, and and it, anytime he comes along with to with me to to do a recording and help with the drums, it always makes for a better finished product. Yeah, most he has a really good ear for drum tuning. And uh, he's a drum nerd. He's he's all about it. He really knows it well. He he knows how to play and he knows how to make them sound good. And he knows what's what. Really knows his stuff. He's a great drum great drum tech. Right on. But uh, let's see. I think I'm gonna move to. Now I have to tell you about these two. It, this is another period where things kind of happen so fast. It's hard to keep all the you know you don't retain a lot of memories and also it's just kind of hard to keep everything in order maybe you can tell me Michael let me see Uh-oh. it was either this oh. we're number one mm-hmm. or the Malcolm tent <laughs> seven inch do you remember which one was first because uh, I don't we're number one came first. okay let's yeah. do that then okay we're number one <laughs> yeah there you go if you ain't got one of these with uh the fantastic comic book that came with it you might not get it you might not get it i mean you might get one uh, a new record one day if it gets repressed but i don't know about the books the book alone yes. is yes. worth the price of admission on that it's one of the Absolutely. awesomest things that ever <laughs> ever came in a record ever really it's full full color full-sized anti-scene comic book or is it black and white i forget but it might as well um, be full color you know it's black and white, but let's just say that it's colorful regardless. Yeah. Because it, I mean, tell I the mean, story. <laughs> let me see if I can get it without the glare. But I mean, you can see the detail that goes into this a lot more than goes into your average comic book. This yeah. was done by uh, Jamie Vida, who is an excellent artist and also a, a fantastic singer who is on um, several mystery school releases. Hmm. He was in the band um, Lookout Mountain Daredevils. Um, mm-hmm. CCCR, um, the Stove Bolts, which which don't have a Mystery School record release, but he was in that in that band. And he, he's he's a fantastic artist in this comic style. Yeah, he even had a, a comic book of his own called Loud Comics, which I really enjoyed. And um, that's all based around rock and roll stories from people we know and are associated with, you know, kind of worldwide and the punk and rock and roll scene but mm. i'm telling you if you can get a hold of this with the book that's that's this is one of the record collector holy grails right here that's a good one proud to say i've got one in my collection and i'm also very happy to say that uh, one of the tracks on that record has recently crept back into the anti-scene live set um uh, fight like apes oh yeah that was a, a great rendition on the uh live from quarantine yeah. broadcast Very and if you good. want to, if you want to talk about unique drum parts and the way that gooch played the drums on that that one was one that had sir barry hannibal working overtime to figure out and to make work you know because barry's style is like more conventional and he had to take this gooch drum part and sort of compress it into something that he could play in his own style and he still ended up like you know playing his Burundi style drums with both hands and like like, I would just love to sit there and watch him do it during practice and when we we played it live it was just like a spectacle of Barry 
playing in the Gooch style. It sounded so good. <laughs> it did. It sounded, <laughs> yeah, it sounded particularly good. Uh, this is the the first one that I didn't record. This is oh. a, a a Barry recording. Barry oh. engineered it, and uh, but I mixed it, and that was a pretty good transition. And and I and I like the the final outcome. This is where I started to realize that this was going to work good. This was having Barry track, and Barry always consults me about the tracking too. Mm. You know, especially in these the first few where he tracked, and and I I didn't come and track, but he's got a great handle on it now. We've kind of got a little formula going, and he's got a, a formula for the the recording, and and some things change from time to time, and there's there's always a little experimentation to try to reach a little bit more and, and get a little bit better. And mm -hmm. and the same goes for me with the, the mixing. There's kind of a, a really good formula and, you know, really on the mixing side, my, my formula for the anti scene sound is, has been developing the whole time ever since I started recording before I was in the band, you know, mm -hmm. but it's based on, on the best recordings from before that time, you know, and, and, and I feel like, uh, and you know, when I get around to the, the most recent records we've done, I feel like it's, it's really got like exactly where it should be, you know, but, um, low fi is my favorite song off this. That, that's a mad yeah. brother ward written song from what I understand. Yeah. That's um, a good one. That was, that was in the set for a while when I first joined the band, always a fun one to play that one. That's, that's, that's what I want to call the radio hit. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's that kind of quality of catchiness and, I mean, it's, all, it's so awesome. It's a fantastic song. I love that. Definitely. Great bass line, too. Yeah. So now, like, from here out, some I, I, don't, I don't have as, quite as much to, to share about some of these records as I wasn't there for the recording, just for the, the mixing, you know. And also, like, like, around this time, it's getting to where I send a mix in, and I, I've got the formula down so much, Jeff doesn't have any – criticisms hardly anymore you know i mean there might be a turn you know turn this down just a little or that up in it, but it's like almost like and and you know him and barry know how to give me the the directions from the start too i mean there's the communication is fantastic it's so easy <laughs> you know it's really gotten easy because we just it's become very routine you know right and at the same time it's it's kept fresh by good ideas and you and there's always new ideas on every record it, it they never cease to amaze me with the ideas they keep coming up with. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, it, it's it's something to, to actually be on the inside of that process and to witness it and participate in it because there's always that push to keep things fresh and original. Obviously, there's a style that we have to adhere to, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like it's got to sound like anti scene, but part of sounding like anti scene is not doing what people think the band is going to do and, and not doing stuff that's really as obvious as it seems like it might be. It's all about that little swerve here, that little jog over there, that little trick inserted over there and you put it all together and you've got this kind of mosaic of uh, what is going on. My props get moved. My lighting rig has been oh dear. compromised. <laughs> You must have must have a union stage crew over there, John Bowman. <laughs> I think they might not be union. That might be the problem. They're not union and wish they were, and they're upset. Oh, dear. Better, better stay out of this one. I don't want any grievances filed. <laughs> now they're mooning me. <laughs> oh, great. Good thing we're, we're pre-recorded. We can, well, actually, there's nothing to cut out. We just have to sort of take your word for the fact that all this, this nasty stuff is happening on our video feed. I learned from a previous podcast that I was on that you can have as, you know, all the nudity you want on Facebook as long as nobody can see it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Great. I found out. Great thing, man. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a spilt beer last time. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. Here it is. All of our, our listeners get to partake of this. They just let your imaginations run rampant, you people. You dirty-minded sods out there. <laughs> this brings me to something funny, too. And, and I'm just going to tell this from my point of view. But I mean, it fits in the anti scene thing. I'm sure the other members have experienced this, too. There's some people out there that think that I or, you know, people that I know that are in bands that I run around with are like, this is all we do. 
and we make a living off of this, you know, mm-hmm. but it just couldn't be further from the truth. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in my basement, my laundry room's right there. I have a mess of a desk over there that looks like the most atrocious, uh, you know, natural disaster that ever happened. I got laundry over there. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I know Tell I've got it looking kind of nice behind me, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, I always find that to be funny, you know, like oh, people's, yeah we would hear things, their perception of us a lot of times on the road and things, you know, it's just very yeah, funny, but, yeah. you know, there's, there's some money to be had, but it ain't enough to live off of, you know, not. Yeah. I know. I've always thought it's, it's about one's ability to jump through as many hoops as possible and be really good at juggling. And that way you can get by. Yeah. And my main point for, for pointing that out too, is that we're, you know, we're doing this for the love of it, you know, oh, and, yeah. and, you know, we have, family and friends that got to put up with us, you know, Oh sure. yeah. You're going to have to cut me some slack. I got to do this record. I'm about to do that tomorrow. I'm going to do some vocal. I got to do a vocal session tomorrow. I got to make all my whole family be quiet for like three hours and, <laughs> you right. know, and I'm right. going to get upset at every little bump in the house or something. You know what I mean? Oh, sure. sure. All the, all these records I'm talking about, all the things that anybody will ever see come out of me or most of my friends, it's a labor of love. And it's done. It's like, it's like pulling teeth a lot of times because we don't have all, we don't have any, we're doing it. The only resources we have is the new technology that's become accessible and affordable. Yeah. Yeah. And of course the flip side to that though, is that doing it on this level, we have absolute complete control. There's no A&R man saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't think I hear a hit on this one. Go back and record something by this professional team of songwriters that we're going to charge to your label account. Or, you know, the, the, the we're number one. It didn't quite hit the sales target. I think for the next one, you better use this staff producer we have. We're going to charge you for that, too. There's no, we don't have to deal with any of that. It's yeah, all I, ours. It's, be- it's a beautiful thing. It really is. You know, I, I mean don't get me wrong sometimes i have the the fantasy of you know being king shit with a multi-million dollar recording budget and making the you know grand you know the you know the gem of my entire catalog you know, uh, or whatever but yeah i know i know that i would have to sacrifice that too i have somebody to tell me what to do you know if yeah. if i want some guidance while i'm working on something i just lean on one of my friends you know and tell them shoot me straight you can hurt my feelings you know and if something's good they tell me it's good if if it sucks, they tell me it sucks, you know, and I adjust, you know, and I love yeah. that. It's a beautiful thing, you know. <laughs> Definitely. There's the artistic purity. You can't put a price on that. Now, let's talk about one uh, of the best team ups ever. <laughs> let's. The record that just had to be, just had to happen. Yes. And it did. Look at that. I like how it doesn't say anything crazy like the Malcolm Tit split, or the, it just says, and I seen Malcolm Tit. That's all yeah. you need to know. That's all you need to know. Yeah, that's it, man. That's it. Who would have <laughs> ever thought that you're looking at like a sort of prototype version of the current lineup of the band? I never would have guessed. So, yeah, that that's the thing, too. I, did, I would have never known. I'd have never known and said, hey, in a year or two, Malcolm will be in the band. Yeah. I'd have nev- never known. Yeah. You know, never. For, for me, if that record had come out, that would have been enough. You know, just the fact that I got to see my name on a record with Anti Scene. They do one of my songs. I do a couple of theirs. Really? Like, could you really ask for a whole lot more? Well, no. But if it comes mm-hmm. along, we'll certainly take it. Everything that's on here is totally suitable to you. I mean, it's just like, I mean, this is you know in case anybody's confused this is a punk rock record this Hell thing is yeah. rude crude <laughs> lewd and not for your parents and not for your preacher and not for your teacher no you it's can't rotten, play, you, cannot play the the, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot play the the anti-scene version of don't tell your mom in polite company no and, and let me tell you i laugh my ass off at that thing i laugh i've got it on a cd and listen to it on my way to work sometimes when i know i'm going i'm going in for a rough day yeah that will, that bright that brightens everything up and i can have a little bit of a laugh you know and mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a great tune i should lobby to get that one in the set i don't think that's i don't think that's ever been played live to the best of my knowledge the tunnel rat song no, I don't believe so. When I was in the band, I, 
I think I'm remembering this correctly. I'm pretty sure it was Jeff would refer to us as a rocking teenage combo. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> I think that the rocking teenage combo thing really fits when you listen to Don't Tell Your Mom. That sounds like a song from a rocking teenage combo. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> don't tell your mom about these horrible damn things you've been doing and that have been going on around you. Just don't even mention it. You know, yep. they're not going to understand. They ain't going to like it. It'll be more trouble than it's worth. Just yeah. be quiet. <laughs> I think I lived that for a lot of years, you know, when I was younger too. Don't you know, me and my brother, don't tell mom about that, you know. Don't know well, that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what your your job and your duty is at, at that age, you know. You're not supposed to do everything that your parents want you to do. No, absolutely not. <laughs> you're not supposed to when you're an adult, especially. <laughs> yeah, seriously, man. <laughs> The funny thing about my story is I, I didn't do what my parents really wanted me to, and uh, it come around to be good. Now they like what I do. Oh. <laughs> All right. So it's, as much as he tried. It, yeah, they put they, they put one record I made on the wall with like the the seven inch sleeve open, and you can see the lyrics. I'm like, y'all know what y'all put? Y'all really read that, didn't you? Really? <laughs> you do know what you put on your wall <laughs> what, what, <laughs> at your uh, house. <laughs> what record was that? It's 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 the War Boys seven inch. Wow. Yeah, like, you, know, you, you do know what you put up. And they're like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, man, cool. this is pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. But yeah, I love this. And this, I consider this one one of my best mixes. It's a good one. And I mean, and the the funny thing about it is I decided on this and I was like, I'm going to see what I can, like how little I can do and get by. Mm. And it worked. And I And the reason why it worked is because the tracking was so good. Mm-hmm. And that's and I didn't have to do a lot. I don't know yeah. why that coincided, but that it worked perfect. I said I'm not doing that much. I'm doing a bare minimum, and and now it's kind of like that's that's a strategy now that I didn't have before, and that that's really important, you know, to mm-hmm. do as little as you can, you know, because if if you're doing something that's not necessary, you're doing too much. Right. You know? That doesn't mean you can't get wild. You know, you can start those under that premise, but you know, it, it's been important. Something I've held on to ever since, and and my yeah. record making continues to improve. You know, and yeah. and that actually leaves more room for the creative stuff, the things that seem a little extra, because I didn't spend so much time making sure those compression settings were exactly exactly perfect, and didn't you know, just totally. I didn't worry, you know, so. It just it became more less mechanical, more artistic. Right. And this was a big turning point for that. Right on. You know. Well, I, I do know that when I got the test pressing for that, and I put on the anti scene side, I was just like, yeah, this is exactly <laughs> like when I I wrote that song "Do It Now" with anti scene in mind back in 1992, and so we didn't they didn't actually record it until whatever 2016. So I waited 24 years to hear them do that song. And when I finally dropped the needle in the groove, it was perfect. It was like just the way I wanted it to sound. And when I first heard, yeah, when I first heard that too, I remembered that billboard. I seen the same billboard Ah, when I was a kid. Man, in 1992, I was only like 11 years old. And I remember seeing that and being like, damn, that's grim. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, the, the song Do It Now was based on this public service announcement billboard that said, get high, get stupid, get AIDS. And I just added Do It Now and um, <laughs> like totally wrote it. it was, I was in town for Anti Scene's 10th anniversary show in 1992. And it was just one of those songs that just just came right then, right then and there. And I like wrote it down as quickly as I could before I forgot it. And um, I, I showed it to them soon thereafter. So that song had been in, it's been on the, the back burner of anti-scene for 23, 24 years until it finally got to the front burner and recorded. And in the meantime, I'd put it in my own solo acoustic set. It was like a really popular tune when I'd go out there and just play it live on acoustic guitar. People loved it but it was always meant to be a, like a full blown anti scene song with guitar, bass, drums, vocals, and Jeff Clayton singing it. And it finally yeah. happened. 
worked out nice. It really did. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, and I do like that your selections are, you know, um, pertinent. I guess that would be the word. Animals yeah. eat them. Yeah. Yeah. My God can beat up your God. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And for those who don't know the backgrounds on those, <laughs> uh, mm. My God can beat up your God is a song that my ancient Floridian punk rock bands did in 1984 and anti-scene stole that one in 1992 and then when i started doing my solo acoustic thing i simply stole their arrangement and put it in my set so honor among thieves kids in action right there and then animals eat them we all know classic anti-scene song i just thought that since i've, I've been a full-time vegan for a very long time and a full-time vegetarian for a long time before that what better song to do than a song about the joys of eating animals. <laughs> so there you go. It's <laughs> great. And, Love and it. Also, also it always give me an opportunity when I play that song live to tell the story of how it was written basically by Joe Young and the band in the parking lot of my record store. But that's a big, long detour. It's a story that's been told in one of my other broadcasts. We're here with John Bowman right now. We want to talk to you. All right. Well, here we go. Yeah. Ah, why you gotta be, man? Why you gotta be? Why you gotta be so obstinate? I mean, mm. God, you can about say that to anybody because that's just something we're all guilty of. Stubborn, hard-headed, won't budge. Mm. You know, even when we do, there's some lingering obstinance there, you know? Yeah. Now, gotta go back in time a little bit to my time in the band. So, we didn't do like a proper just standalone this is a new album it's all new songs when i was in the band you know i was talking last time new blood was like our album mm -hmm. but it was a it was really a compilation of a bunch of singles now i consider it to be one of the anti-scene albums and i think that that jeff does and other people do if i'm not mistaken but this idea came first hmm. i was at repo depot in lenore hanging out with joe and I believe it was on a practice night. And I'm, I'm sure Jeff and Phil were there too. We usually, when we showed up in Lenore, we didn't go straight to the, the young residents. We went down to Repo Depot mm. because we want to look through records every week too, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, give, and give Joe some business, you know, like, I mean, and that was my thing. I think at the time I only bought records exclusively from Joe. Mm -hmm. I don't think I bought them from anywhere else. Cause first of all, I was going there every week. And second of all, why give anybody else money when you can give one of your best friends the money, you know? Absolutely. And his prices were the most fair. Probably, he probably really was just like the criminally inexpensive, you know, like he, he, he probably should have charged more. I love, man, my record collection is full of records that come from him and I leave the price tags on them because they're all in his handwriting. And I yep. love that. He had this nice little bubble looking handwriting for his prices. And it's always good to see like, your favorite records, fantastic, awesome, just exciting records with the least little price on her, $5, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love that. You're just like, oh, I got the greatest thing in the world. And and, and actually, a lot of them Joe would, would give me. Oh, mm. you just don't worry about it, you know? Right. Just get, uh, get me a beer and we're on the road again or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But we're we're doing that one day we're there at the record store and I think I'm thumbing through some records and everybody else is and Joe's talking. He's like, man, I got an idea for an album. You know, he said it should be called obstinate. And at first I was just like, sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say it. I didn't say it to him. Uh -huh. And I was like, you know, and I knew what the word meant, you know, but I just, and he said it too. He also read the definition out. And he said this whole he, like he had this ready to go. Hmm. He said it should be in a scene, look kind of like one of the older covers. It should say obstinate. It should have the definition. Hmm. At, at first, I did. I didn't. I, I just it didn't appeal to me. I didn't think it was. But I didn't tell him. You know, I just like okay. You know, if this is an idea, it'll it'll go. And if Jeff likes it, it'll happen. If you know it won't, you know whatever. But I kind of didn't get it. Hmm. But it sunk in over time. You know, and I think it finally clicked when they decided that they were going to do it after the fact, you know, after Joe's, Joe's passing. Yeah. I was like, yeah, stubborn, you know, and, and I really got it after Joe passed because in some 
kind of naive way. And maybe it was a little bit of like, you know, I think I had an inability to imagine a band without Joe at the time. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought it was going to come to an end when he passed. I was like, Oh damn. I was like, shit, that's it for Anna scene. You know, Damn, I was like, I couldn't imagine it any other way, you know, Mm -hmm. but talking to Jeff young a little bit, he's like, no, it should go on. And, and he reminded me, so you remember when, when Joe said that if, if something ever happens to him, that Rush should take his place and Mad mm-hmm. Brother Ward on guitar and he knows it and he can do it. And he did. He said that in the van on several trips we were on, you know, hmm. so I really, not only did I buy into this being a good idea, I mean, I really had no choice. Like I, 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 I didn't just decide like, you know, it just, it happened. Hey guys, we're going to do this. You know, it's like, nah. Yeah not really <laughs> it happened. and this was right and it was it was really the perfect time to do it Obson. like a lot of people would say man you know this band was always jeff and joe and it can't be no other way and mm-hmm. but no nah, man and i seen's obstinate even when things are going bad even when it ain't easy you keep on doing it yep. you don't quit you're hard-headed and you keep on trucking you know even yep. when everybody's hating on you you know you know what i mean like <laughs> just you know yeah i mean that's it i mean that's the first thing i thought when i when i saw that record because Jeff sent me a copy of it and I, I didn't know it was coming out or anything. I was still not like totally in the loop with everything, but he sent me a copy of it. I opened it up and I said, yeah, <laughs> obstinate. That's it. That's totally perfect. Perfect. I don't know if they were in the same year or different year, but I may, I may have actually mucked up the order on these. I'm not sure. See, I'm not, not, not hundred so... percent certain myself. We'll assume you're right. This hard. <laughs> this was good, and this this was this was this was fun to work on, but this was kind of hard too. Yeah. This was done in a couple different sessions. Usually, when Anna seen records, and usually when I record, I try to get at least like the drums all in one session. You know, and if there's got to be another set, you know, if it's something you can't all do all in one day, this will be drum day. This will be bass and guitar day. This will be vocals day or something, you know, no matter what my project is, you know. And I try to advise that for anybody recording anything that I'm going to mix because then you get a lot of consistency, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, on the other hand, I can, I, I, can, I can make a consistent record out of stuff that's been done in many sessions, you know, and I did do that on this, but it's harder, you know. It really is. It takes more time, might cost the band more, so on and so forth, you know. So I usually advise like a kind of strict recording schedule and stuff, but this wasn't quite done this way. Now it was close, but there was definitely two drum days and two drum setups. So, you know, maybe it was multiple days. I don't know, but it made it a little bit of a challenge, but I also think in the end, it makes this really good. It's not just like a flat mix through the whole thing. There's a lot of variation in, in, in really good ways, you know, yeah. and there's actually some happy accidents on this that, or some of the best parts for instance the song static mm-hmm. hi-hat was just it seemed way too loud you know jeff was telling me man if you can get that hi-hat down and I, I tried and i just couldn't get it down low enough to satisfy him or me i just had to tell him that jeff that's just what it is man it's just a big open loud as hell hi-hat like it's getting the shit beat out of it and you just can't do nothing about it the end of the day it almost makes the song the song's mm. called static and the, the main lyric is it's all just static to me and then you've got you know yeah, hi-hat that. that's way <laughs> yeah it's perfect it's like the irritation that he's describing in the song it's it, it's one of the best happy accidents on anything i've worked on. Right on and it's and it's a happy accident that sticks out a lot of happy accidents fade with time you forget they were happy accidents and you might even give yourself credit man i was awesome when i said to do that or you know <laughs> that that one's not going to fade that that turned around on me i don't i don't know if that's the same for everybody else involved but it was for me that 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 ended up i think that's a very happy accident mm-hmm. i just hope jeff i hope jeff feels the same because he might accuse me of just trying to get my way and i don't yeah. want to do that because it really i'm telling the truth on this you know <laughs> Well, even if not, just tell them you're being obstinate. <laughs> there, yeah, there you go. There's my out. <laughs> I, I, man, I love this album. I, I love that it's short. To me, this is almost like a return to Eat More Possum era mm. in a way. Mm-hmm. But not the same either. You know, you know, I mean, just just as fr- you know, just as fresh as anything else. But also almost like a return to form. 
And I, and I, di- I dig this one. It's actually been a while since I listened to this. I think I'm going to do that. Now, Atomic Clock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love that song. Yeah. When I worked on it, though, I did not love it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever put more, like, effort, like, into like, the most painstaking detail that I ever put into that. That was... That was a tough thing. Was like, that because was that because of the uh, the dialogue? Um, pretty much anything you hear that's not just guitar, bass, and Jeff's vocals was a a big stressor. Yeah, it was hard. Mm-hmm. Like all these things needed to happen at the right time, and they were some were more or less recorded at the right time. Some things were kind of decided later. It's kind of like after it was recorded, it's like, oh, that needs to do this, and that needs to do that, and it, it was really tough, you know, and mm. for for things that get intricate like that now we got a little better communication understanding on it. And now the stuff is, if there's some wild stuff going on, it's delivered to me like exactly the way it needs to be. Right. Barry's got a total handle on that. He takes care of all that and it, it's a lot easier, but God, that, that thing was, a it was a, a stress to say the least. Right. I mean, I was almost like, I was almost like to the point where I was like, if they give me anything like this ever again in the future, I'm just not going to do it. Mm. I didn't tell them that time. This is going to be news to them, I think. But I was just like, I, I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell them, kiss my ass. I ain't doing it. I can't do that kind of stuff no more. But I'm a glutton for punishment. I would, even if Barry, oh, even if like... Barry didn't have it, <laughs> even if Barry didn't have it locked down like he does, I, I you know, I would do it. I would do yeah. that. I would do that. I would do that song again, even. You know? <laughs> But this man, it's a fantastic album. And it's very man, fantastic. I'm overusing that word because it's really a it just really is a good damn word to describe this album. It's varied too. It's not just one song after the other, same kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. Man, I'm a big Queen fan. And on the very first song on here, there's a vocal thing that's kind of like some Queen stuff. But I didn't know they wanted it like that. So I kind of had it well, you know, like, you know, and I seen vocal level. When Jeff got back to me and said, man, think about like, turn that thing up like queen. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh hell yeah. Well, get <laughs> turn that. It. And it's got Greg on there. You always hear Jeff talking about Greg. Greg's got this awesome high vocal that he can do. Mm. And, and it's on there. It's all over that song. Cool. But I love it. Let's see. Whew. I think I'm going to move on now. Yeah, it's a good one. Let's, what could possibly follow that? The question another on, on another good one. Yeah, yeah, dying, like breed. dying breed. Imagine that. Yeah, another uh, killer. This is fun because it's a. Uh, people ask about hell a lot. The covers album. Mm-hmm. People really love that album. It's it's really good. I love it. Um, we had plans when I first joined the band to do a follow up called Heaven, and I think Jeff has talked about that. Yeah. But we just didn't do it, and and uh, I don't know how much I was actually considered, but that might partially be my fault because I I didn't want to start off with a covers album, being new to the band. I want to do new material because mm. I had the song One Shot One Kill, and I want to do that. You know? right. And I and I just and also you know Jeff had told me that that the band was in bad shape before we joined. It was time to re recock and get it back on track, you know. Mm. And I just didn't I didn't think starting off with a bunch of covers was the way to go. I may have been wrong or, you know, I don't know. Maybe I was right. Maybe I was right. I mean, maybe the, the fact that we went with some originals first proves that I was right. But I don't think I had to, I don't think I had to make a big declaration or anything either, mm-hmm. but, but that's, what's great about this album. It's almost like a mini covers album, but this time, it's bands that Anna I seen knows or associated with in, in some ways. Yeah. Including self-made monsters. Right. Includes the, the song hook, which I was played many times live on stage. Mm-hmm. One band on there. One band though, that is not a uh, part of the immediate family. That uh, anti scene covered. But one that uh, I certainly remember oh, from when I was a kid. The Osmonds. The Osmonds. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm sure that I've said a hundred times since we've been doing these interviews that this is one of the greatest things I've done. This is one of the greatest things I've done. <laughs> but, but this you get, one. You get to say that when you've done a lot of good shit. Yeah, yeah. 
Crazy Horses is great. And and Jeff asked me to play the guitar solo on it. Oh. Now, I consider myself to be a really good rhythm guitar player, but I've never felt really good as a lead player. I'm still just now getting kind of comfortable, and that has a lot to do with my band, my current bandmate, Brian, who I was talking about. He's just such a fantastic guitar player. I'll just sit and watch him. And I've picked up on a lot and it's, it's brought me, he's brought me along a lot, but this is still during a time where I was just like, I don't think I can do that. You know, mm. or I don't know. And I, or I thought it might be just like too much of a, a hassle for me. Like it might take too long or not be as good as they want. And I was like, Hey, you know, uh, why don't you get, why don't you get Steve Wenzel to do it? He can do, he can do anything from the, previously of the dead Kings who I've played with in the band tankified, which I haven't mentioned on here. Oh, yeah. I don't believe, but, uh, <laughs> Jeff said, well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want Steve to be on it because we're doing a dead King song and I want this to be a surprise. I said, okay, I understand. That. I said, well, what about, what about Brian? Did you care Brian? You know, and he, he insisted, he said, I want you to do it. So I couldn't say no at that point, but it worked out in my favor. It, 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 you know, I, I learned it and it actually suited my playing and, mm. and I, I enjoyed doing it too. And I, I'm perfect song friend. I seen the cover. That's perfect. <laughs> yes. And I really like uh, the song Fred Kirby on here by the loose, L- originally by the loose lug nuts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I did not grow up in Charlotte. And I, only, I, I was only an hour away, but a lot of the stuff they mentioned in the song is familiar to me. Mm. The, the line about you, you took you used to could take independence to get somewhere yeah it's kind of an important line it used to be that the main street through the the city and you did you took independence to get a lot of places and i even did that you know on some of my trips to the city while i was growing up and uh then when i moved to the city as an adult you you don't take independence to get anywhere (laughs) hardly you know what i mean maybe if you're coming from out of town you need to get to a certain location it's a good way to go and get off on a exit and be there you know yeah Uh, Tommy's pub in particular. That's about the only reason I end up on independence. Um, hmm. It's a bar that I would before the shutdowns was playing at regularly and it's an easy way to get there. But I like that line because of that. You, you know, you took independence to get some growing up mentioned independence Boulevard, you know, whether, whether the business was on it or that's what you had to take to get there. So that it's good. It's just one of them nostalgic type things. And then the Fred Kirby, you know, for those who don't know, Fred Kirby was a, a man who wore cowboy hat, cowboy outfit, played acoustic guitar, sang some songs. And on Saturday mornings when I was a kid, he would introduce the Little Rascals, the Aaron of the Little Rascals. And he sang that song that you hear on here. You know, how I love the Little Rascals, Little Rascals, Little Rascals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the tune to The More We Get Together. Right. That old, that old tune. But yeah, Fred Kirby's a, a big memory of mine because I saw him every Saturday morning when I was watching cartoons and the Little Rascals. There was Fred Kirby broadcasting from Tweetsie Railroad, oh, yeah. where I would go sometimes as a kid. And, and somewhere at my parents' house, there's a picture of of him holding me, and I was probably about the, the age of my son, you know, like real little. But so that yeah, I, I love that, and it's a country song too. And I seen do, you know, and I seen doing a country song, and quite quite faithfully. Um, the Kiff song, it's like taking candy from a baby, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Knowledge yeah. is for fools. That's a fine <laughs> band right there. That's a great band name too. I love it really it. is. Kind of, ex- kind of explains like the, the default attitude of a lot of people, you know, a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's my favorite song of theirs. It's like taking candy from a baby, baby. Mm-hmm. It, Kit, Kit, those guys are pretty good friends of mine, and they would they would they invited War Boys a few times to come play in in Raleigh, and and we played with them in Anna scene, of course, or played with them in Anna scene, of course, and uh, they have a gimmick during this song where Andy, the singer, comes out with a bunch of roses, and as he's singing, he goes and gives it to all the ladies, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, one time he comes up to me with one, and I was just going to graciously accept, it, and he snatches it back. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, man, this I just love the song and and they did a really good job. And I don't know if I should should mention I'll leave it up to Jeff if he wants to, but there is there's a sample on here that maybe shouldn't be. I'll leave that up to him if he wants to 
to mention it, but I, I won't ask and <laughs> I certainly won't tell. There might be some real deal rock and roll heads that can identify it, but I doubt it. I really huh, doubt it. All right. I'm going to have to go and listen to that with a new critical ear. <laughs> Probably tonight when we're done. Well, it's fresh in my mind. You might be able to get it. I, I'll put it to you this way. I would have never been able to get it. And I don't think it's anything you could ever, anybody could even prove really, but hmm. it's all strange, right. you know, it would be really hard. Accepted. Challenge but. accepted. <laughs> Let's see. Run You Down by the Dead Kings. That was the first song of theirs I heard recorded of the Dead Kings. And the Dead Kings, I, I found out about the same night I saw and I seen for the first time because they were one of the open acts for the 20th anniversary show. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's the band I'm close to. And, and I believe those guys were some of the ones putting a bug in Jeff's ear about me, you know, t telling him I would be a good person to be in the band. But I love this record. It, it was pretty easy to do. It was pretty easy to mix and get done. Yeah. And I had a good time. The art's fantastic. It's got more uh, Jamie Vida artwork on it. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, it's been made into at least one poster, um, probably some flyers. I know Barry's got a framed poster of that hanging in the studio. Looks great as a poster. That's the... I think that's the cover of the overrun edition of this with the yeah I it's got a that, different sleeve and i think it's that on the front if i'm not mistaken i haven't seen mine yet it's actually waiting at the post office right now i was supposed to go today go today to pick my copy of that up at the post office but we had a uh i don't know if it was actually a tornado but we had some very heavy weather today and the post office lost power so i couldn't go and pick up my copy of the dying breed overrun which I really want because I too am a collector, you know, I'm not just a member of the band. I'm an anti-scene collector. Uh, that's one reason why I love talking about this stuff because it's cool. It's fun. Something, I've, something I failed to mention about this era of the band and my involvement is this also during this time, the Dina sods come back into the fray mm. and I'm <laughs> literally everything comes out of his mouth is funny as hell. <laughs> He is hilarious. And I didn't know it, but he, he's from pretty close by where I'm from as well. He's about as close as Joe was from where I'm from. Mm. So it's, that's another, it's, I've, I've met him once, I think in person, but I've talked to him online a little bit and uh, it's same kind of thing. Just the kind of person that you just feel like you've known all your life. It just kind of character you, you would have experienced, you know, growing up or farting around in your hometown. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, he is funny as hell on uh i believe it was on lord i got records all over the place now. i believe it was on we're number one's where he come back i think and that's where they i think it's that one where they talk about the anti scene hotline that is the funniest little skit i've ever heard on a record i think and the the small little things on that that maybe like go you know just go by other people and notice like Jeff is sucking on a straw like a like a totally almost empty soda full of ice and he's like you hit a you know in between <laughs> talking and, <laughs> and then the Dean of Sods gives his big old spiel like it's the and I seen infomercial you know, and then the talk at the end about there not actually being a hotline. <laughs> right. <laughs> For anybody that hasn't heard that you got to go, you got to hear it. You got to listen to that. Gotta if hear you it, you need the record. Save it for a day when you need a good laugh because it's going to produce one. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right, what else do we have? I think we're sort of almost up to date. If we're not, we're getting there. Uh, we've got about three more. Woo, crazy. All right, so, and I'm trying to tell some of these stories without saying more than, you know, I'm trying to leave Jeff a little something, up, but I'm sure he'll have a lot more to say about it. But yeah, No doubt. Something we talked about a lot of time, even when I was in the band, is uh, there was a couple wish list places we wanted to go. One was Australia, and that's uh -huh. still on Jeff's wish list. And the other was Japan. And I think I made Japan worse of a wish list place to go for Jeff because I had spent a year there. So I'd tell him, oh, man, it's awesome. Like uh -huh. just, you're talking about fun and nice people and even though being totally lost with the language easy to get around because you can find help you know it's, mm -hmm. 
but I can't, I couldn't say enough nice things about that country. Seriously. I know, I know the old history of it. It seems hard to even imagine now, but, but damn, man, the people are nice. They respect for everybody cares about doing things the right way and being orderly. It's just, I don't know, man. It's just so something about it is so relaxing to me and they're so easy going while they're doing it too. Mm. It's really strange. And they love to have fun. They love, you know, very creative activities and, and art. They, they love art. They love music. And there's some things I don't like when I was there. Music's very expensive to buy over there. Yeah. The whole time I was there, it's like, you want a CD? That's, you know, it's $30 basically for a CD when I was there. And that was. I actually did a, a, an episode of my own webcast about that, about why there are so many Japanese live albums for the exact same reason they were looking for any kind of a product that the Japanese will actually buy domestically because it's so much cheaper to buy imports than just to buy a domestically produced Japanese album. Yeah, here's the thing though, when I was when I was throwing that thirty dollar price out there, which I'm trying to remember how the money worked there. It's like it's funny, yen is like if we if, if ever here we only had pennies and no dollars. Right. Like a, one yen is like at the time I was there it was almost it was almost equal to a penny. Yeah. So I think it was like three thousand yen up but that was for the American CDs. Mm-hmm. Now the upside was you got somewhere between two and, and five bonus tracks usually. Yeah. Usually that leftover stuff that didn't go on the album in the United States was on that Japanese version. Exactly, which is the other marketing ploy to get people to buy the domestic product. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise yeah. they would just get the regular American or English version that didn't have bonus cuts. Mm-hmm. So that was it. They were trying to give value for money. But I, I, I talked Japan up big time, and especially Tokyo, which is where they ended up going. You know, And uh, oh, I'm trying to think of what the song was. Oh, it's um, Big Audio Dynamite, which Jeff is a big fan of. In one of those uh, songs, they mention uh, the Lexington Queen, which is a bar there. It's a, it's like a party bar. It's like a dance club thing. And the beauty of it is even if you're a sorry-ass dancer like me, you can go in there mm-hmm. and the place is packed so damn wall-to-wall that this is about all you can move. So <laughs> everybody's a fucking awesome dancer at the Lexington Queen in Rapungi in Tokyo. Yeah. But I, I talked Japan up good. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure that, you know, <laughs> I helped the desire get there. And, man, they got the opportunity and went. Yes. And luckily, some live audio was recorded, Woo. and it sounded really good. Woo. And then I got to fix it up to Woo. make this gym. Yeah, look at that. I love it. Live in Japan, as man. the unimpeachable and, president for life would say. And I, I've got to say all these all these big twelve inches that I've been showing you from from you know after my time in the band, these are all TKO releases. Yeah. And I'm talking about the top notch product. They do not cheap out. It's Cascade pressing plant. In case anybody wants to know and do business, it is fantastic. Yeah, that thing is that's a loaded package right there. This is not only a record, you know, live record. This is like a a photo album. It's like a a a souvenir, if you will, of their time there. And that's how Jeff described it to me. Yeah. And it's just packed full of the, the pictures. And then when you get the, the record out, you got pictures all over this. And then when you pull the record out, you got your big Japanese flag. You have to salute. And then on the other side, you got your favorite band. I love this. And it's got one of the best versions of Fuck All Y'all on it because the band that they played with over there, Ray Ketsu Blizzard, plays along with them. Mm-hmm. And just make it sound so damn cool. And something I've always liked about Japanese bands is they'll do covers of songs in English. And even if they don't speak a word of English, they'll just learn it phonetically and do it. And they'll do it as close as they can. But it just, like, it's, it's close enough to be the song, but it's different enough to be this whole other thing that you can enjoy. And, and it's also gets kind of comical as well because you just hear, you hear some words is just like, Oh man. So that's what, that's what they heard. Like, this is what the word really is, but they heard this, which sounds like a whole other word. It's just interesting. You can listen to it a hundred times and notice these nuances, these different nuances every time. But 
Sure. It's a it's a great recording and a, it were great performances. It was really fun to work on. I love that. Wish I could have went, you know, that would have been great. I, was... I think we all do. <laughs> I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm just sort of waiting for the next time, you know, waiting for the phone to ring and say, hey, come back to Japan. I mean, it's like, if it happens on my watch, I wouldn't complain. Well, I hope you'll get to because it's, it's an experience. It's almost like going to another planet. Mm. I really had, they only got to spend a couple of days there. It's really, it's not enough time to really take it in like you need to. Yeah. I mean, I, I spent a year there and it wasn't enough time, <laughs> but I also think that's cool. The first time I ever heard of in, I seen that's where I was in Japan. Yeah. In a library and, reading a book. <laughs> And then they get to go all these years later and they get to work on the record after yeah. being in the band. I mean, it's just, I couldn't have predicted. There's no way there's, you know, see, there you go. It's another read, one of those circumstances. You just can't guess. Reading that book and never, I mean, it never occurred to me. You'll be in that band. You'll get to do this. The, these, these people be some of your best friends and you get to make all these records with them. Music. It's <laughs> yeah. It really truth, the truth is stranger than fiction, you know. If somebody had me come up with a story, what do you think will happen to you? Well, I'll go home eventually, and I'll I'll start me a little band up and, and you know, do something. Well, you know, play after just, work on the weekends, or you know, yeah. I mean, but that's just why it's so it's it's so critical. I think Woody Allen was the one who said that uh, success is ninety five percent just showing up you know, or being there, or being available, you know, or, or being ready at the time, you know, Just, like if you, you got the chops, when the call comes, you're good to go. I didn't mention it at the time last time we talked, but uh, you, you talked about the whole thing about, um, I might have it wrong, but opportunity being, uh, you know, the right mixture of preparedness and something. Do you remember? Luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. There you go. I was thinking at the time and I couldn't remember, but I remember now that I believe that was Cicero. Oh, ancient Roman. I think he might've been a, one of them philosophers there, but yeah, well, that's, 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 that's totally true. That it's totally true. And that's the only reason I got to do any of this. Exactly. You know, I think about my, you know, the, the reason I'm in the band right now is when Jeff Clayton sent out, an APB looking for a bass player. I was apparently the first one to text back. Yes. And that was it. Did you ever think like, how the hell am I going to do this? I live 13 hours away. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. I, I just said, yes, I put I mean, no, I, no thought into it. I mean, I know you're a highly mobile guy, but I think I still in those shoes would have been like, oh shit, what I just do? <laughs> well, you know that, that was that was part of it, you know, and that, I think that's I think that's where the preparedness aspect of it comes into it because when I do my solo acoustic thing or when I'm playing with Ultra Bunny or you know doing my noise project, my benchmark as it is is to play sixty shows a year, you know, and that means a lot of road work. So I'm already hardwired to be traveling for 60 days a year. It's like, that's what I want to do every single year with whomever. And so, you know, when Anti-C needed someone to play bass for the I Hate God and, and the Obsessed Tour, which was, I think, 11 days total, I was like, great, that's 11 out of 60. No worries. Let's go. And um, however long it was, a week later, 10 days later, I'm there at the rehearsal space in Charlotte, ready to go. Um, unlike you, we had two <laughs> rehearsals. You had one, we had two. <laughs> so I keep lamenting the fact that my memory is so bad, but I just remembered another reason why my memory can be so bad about my time in the band. That's that Joe kept up with so much. He mm -hmm. always kept a calendar. It always had our dates on it. And he even kept a record of our old dates. We had already did on the wall. And he was always interested in those statistics and, yeah. uh, he he was a, he was a sports fan, not a really over the top one, but he he you know was a sports fan and like that played into that I think that statistics and he always would tell me how many shows we played that year and yeah yeah you know and but that's why I can't remember him I always just relied on him to yeah. do all that you, you, you know? never had to you know 
it, it's odd. That's one of the, the features on my website, which is malcolmtent.net, M-A-L-C-O-L-M-T-E-N-T.net. I've got a page on there that's my entire gig history from 1983 to the present day. Damn, Every can, single show. I can't even do that for War Boys, and we've been only a band for five years. I, mean, I think that I actually worked it out through Flyers one time, but I'm sure that I'm off by a few. There's always going to be a couple. You know, I, I just found one. This, this won't mean anything to anybody, but I was digitizing a bunch of tapes, and I came across this old cassette. I don't know if anybody can actually see this. Came across this cassette of a gig by this one-off band I had called the Gregor Samza Experience. We played exactly one show in 1991. And I, of course, taped it because I do that with everything. And this wasn't on my gig list. So it kind of it totally made my day when I found this and was able to digitize it. And now I can put it on the official gig list because I'm just that way. I'm just <laughs> that way. I love statistics. I love keeping track of things. I love seeing that actual, real factual history. And it's not just me, anybody, you know, like I'm, I'm a big fan of like the KISS fact book, which is like nothing but dates of gigs and locations and attendances and, you know, who was the stage crew on this tour and who was the lighting crew on that tour. I just love that stuff. Just information. Have you, have you KISS nerded out with Russ yet? He's got me beat, man. He he and Barry, <laughs> I can't keep up with those dudes. No way. It's like talking to Russ about territory wrestling of the 70s. I'm not even in the same book as those guys, let alone on the same page. <laughs> Talk about Kiss. I can hold my own, but yeah, they got me beat. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I love it, man. The, the van rides are never boring. You know, no, we just, and we made it a point to never listen to music and never listen to talk radio. We always had conversation. Yeah, that's what it, we did. Or, or so quiet, if, you know, quiet if we needed sleep and stuff. But yeah, and, oh, yeah, I never got tired of the conversations. And Jeff and Joe's stories were always good. You know, it's it's a lot of the stories that that Jeff has told since he started going live. I knew already, but they're still great stories to listen to because you might get. A detail you didn't get last time right and plus it's us doing I mean, this is what we do it's it's yeah, rock and roll and then just move on. yeah the stories are always good even if, if you don't get the the extra detail you know and and i think i think we had a really good time from doing that i mean i just i don't like getting in a van and listening to a bunch of music when I'm with a bunch of other people, especially if it's people that I like to be around and interested in what they have to say. And unless, of course, unless, of course, we're all marking out to the same bands, you know, it's like on one of our drives, Russ put on some grand funk and that's like, that's my trigger right there when, when the grand funk starts cranking. So we're sitting there analyzing every song on the album and, you know, dissecting it and picking it apart. And the same thing will happen when they play Kiss. It's just... That to me is as much fun as almost anything. This well, you see the the key there is there's still conversation. Yeah, true. true. Yeah. We're not just we're not just vegging out. We're like really, really getting into it. All right. And speaking of getting into it, let's move on, man. We've been here for seventy seven minutes so far. We still got two releases. You serious? Seventy seven minutes, mother. Seventy seven. Oh, all right. Anybody that knows me knows that I hate Christmas. I don't give a damn about it. I don't like it. You know, I don't, I don't like spending all this money. I'm not religious. I, I don't, I hate Christmas. I hate Christmas songs. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hate being in stores. I hate buying stuff. I hate spending money, but I like this Christmas record Yeah. because it's not your average Christmas record. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. First of all, you got the meanest damn punk rock band that ever lived doing Snoopy's Christmas. Mm -hmm. What in the hell is that? <laughs> you gotta love that. Second of all, it ain't some bullshit version of it. It's really damn good. It's really well thought out and really well executed. <laughs> Second of all, it's got all kinds of guests on here. We got Tesco V from the Meat Men. We got Jeff Dahl. We got PP Duvet. We got, let's see, I mean, Tom O'Keefe. We got Greg back again. We got me. 
Steve Sadler, Phil is back again. Phil Keller, the Dina Sods is on it. Biggie Stardust is on it from the Dead Kings and Biggie Stardust. I mean, damn, what more do you want? I think there's some that aren't mentioned too, perhaps, but you can't even you can't even find that many stars on a K-Tel album, dude. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> That's good, but this was this was so much fun. This was something different, and I liked it. And it actually made my Christmas a little bit better because right. I actually had some Christmas songs that didn't make me want to die because I've heard them a million times. That Snoopy's Christmas, I probably heard that, the original one, maybe three times in my life before working on this. And then Christmas 76, that's an original. Yeah. So I didn't Damn hear good that. Damn song, man. Damn and good that's song. A, and that's a realistic Christmas song. That's I was I like that one a lot because um, it's a very very honest song. It's a very honest and very emotional song about a very special and real time in somebody's life. Yeah, it's it, it's a it's a nice uh, you know reminiscing about you know, favorable Christmas, but it's not like this idealized, like there's snow and jingle bells and elves jumping around and do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm not sure about this myself and I'm not like all my musical town. I've told this is like all a fluke. I didn't have it. I didn't have any really appropriate music lessons or nothing. I was in a little kid's choir at church one time when I was growing up, but that's it. Everything else is like self-learned. Mm-hmm. But I've heard that there's in the music industry these rules for Christmas songs. They've got to have these certain elements. They do it on purpose, and I think that's what gets in me and just makes me hate the shit out of Christmas songs and can't stand them. Mm-hmm. The sound of sleigh bells, for example. Yeah, and there's I can't remember what it is, but there's something about certain, and I don't like I say I don't know all the terms, but there's something about certain modes and movements and stuff that they purposely put in these Christmas songs to make them like immediately identifiable this is a christmas song Mm -hmm. don't mistake it and this doesn't have any of that shit so there you go and i like it it's got some nice uh oh more jamie vida there's jamie vida i I think he did a pretty good job with everybody on there i think he captured our individual personalities oh that's right now now this is with you on it now (laughs) look at that look at that (laughs) <laughs> was this was this the first one for you? This is, is the first, first. Anna Saint record. That is the first. Sort of did my Bill Wyman impression on that one. And I, I'm not going to try to show it because this, we're not going to be able to see it on the camera. But this is like one side is the music, and the other side's a, a beautiful etching. Yeah, it's a beautiful etching too. It's beautiful. really cool. You've got. I'll try to explain it. if I can see it. My lighting is weird, but it's got uh, it's got some reindeer, and it says "Merry Christmas from Anna Saint." It's really nice. Love it. I'll listen to it again at Christmas time. There Not before. Go. Don't wear right. it out. We're down to one more. Woo, we're almost up to date, man. Hey. This is it. Brand that's, new. That's some product right there. Yeah, brand new. This is cool to me because I, I think that uh, even before I was into Anna scene, I, I liked Poison Idea. I had, um, I'm trying to think of which ones I had. I'm pretty sure I had. Uh, kings of punk and uh i can't remember what else i had but i but i liked them a lot i didn't have a whole lot of them and this is before i was too i was real big on the internet but but i knew about them before and i seen and i've always respected them and liked them and this so this was a thrill to to work on something jerry a's on mm-hmm. and this song kicks ass i never heard the song before this really yeah never heard it oh. now now there's certain wrestling songs i heard growing up like bad street usa I heard, and this is this is the same version I, I played on. It's that same one, the one that uh, was on was previously um, unique to that wrestling CD. Mm. It's the same one, and I'm proud. Of, I, I actually, as much as I like that wrestling CD, I kind of like it in this format better. First of all, because I love vinyl, and then second of all, it's got this hilarious picture on the back. I forget this fellow's name because, like I said last time, I'm not the biggest wrestling mark in the world but i know i know he's from the fabulous free birds i know that much but i know i heard that song back in the day among some other ones that they aired on tv for Mm -hmm. those guys which were always kind of comical to me but i never heard that i never heard this beautiful beauregard song i love it it kicks ass 
And then my buddy Steve's on this one again, playing the uh, second guitar, and he does an awesome job. And he's got a cool style. I mean, the dude can shred like like a you know he can go he can take you straight to the metal realm if he wants to. But he often chooses to keep it kind of simple and mm-hmm. like keep that metal edge, but make it poppy, and it's re- really good. And it works out for this, and he you know he knows how to use a wah wah the right way too, without yeah. being gaudy and shitty love this and it was fun to mix and it was easy to mix because it's so damn it's played so well and so barry's drumming so consistent i'm gonna tell you a lot of drummers you gotta you kind of gotta mash them with some compression and make it a little more consistent barry you almost don't have you do it just because it's almost like a rule not because you really have too much mm-hmm. you know and and there and therefore you get away with less and that actually sounds a lot better yeah but yeah love that and then this one it was just as simple as pulling it out of the vault and doing a little remaster. Boom. There you go. I love, I love it. And this is, this is uh, another reason this is significant. I believe this is the first seven inch out of cascade, which is the TKO pressing plant. Yeah. They actually installed uh, a new press and this is the very first thing off mm-hmm. of it from what I'm told. This is brand new, available right now. Everybody should be ordering it, or I say they're making a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Bye. that's one of the few times somebody other than Joe plays guitar on a Joe era song. Yeah, yeah, and that—that's also that—that that record's kind of like a weird transitional lineup of anti scene. I'm not on that record. It came out in the the really weird time. Hmm. I almost forgot you wasn't on this one. Yeah. In in spite of that, it's still a good record. So we want to talk about what's coming next, what what we've what we've accomplished since then, but isn't yeah, pressed yet. Or? Actually, I think uh, I think Jeff did announce it, and by the time this thing airs, he certainly will have announced. In fact, he he did announcement. He did announce it. So yeah, there's we got a brand new EP coming up. Well, who wants to, do you want to spill the beans on it or, or do I? I mean, you're the guest, but I'm the host. You're the engineer. To, I'm the bass player. I mean, I'm just trying to think of who would be better because uh, I don't know. What, well, whose well, idea was well, That's what I want to know. Whose idea was it to make a concept now, you know, a, a minute yeah, rock that, opera, as that Jeff I, called it? I can't take any credit for that. That was a decision that was made before. I even set foot in the studio. So, um, all right, well, I'll start. If I'm missing anything, you can fill in. Okay. Or vice versa. Or vice versa. No, no, no. You go ahead because uh, I kind of want to, maybe you explain it. And I kind of want to just tell my reaction to it when I heard it, when I started working on it. Well, all right. Um, Anti-scene split 10 inch EP with, our good friends from Mississippi Before I Hang, who are a damn good group and a fine bunch of people. Um, I don't know what's going to be on their side of the record. I haven't heard it yet, but I know that's going to what's going to be on our side of the record is a rock opera centered around Jim, the Reverend Jim Jones and the People's Temple in Guyana. And what you're going to get is two anti-scene originals and one cover by the Hates, classic old punk rock band. The song of theirs called um, Last Hymn. And it's the three songs are going to fit together seamlessly into a coherent whole, telling a story in sound, if you will, of the Reverend Jim Jones and the People's Temple of Guyana. And we all know how that story ends. We're going to paint a picture for you with music, sweet melodies, and lovely words. Or something close to that, the way Similar. we do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've been saying that, and I, I mean, I've been saying it for years, but most recently, like up until recently, I haven't been asked to be interviewed much at all. I think I was interviewed one time ever when I was hmm. in the band and never before that, but many times since and been on podcasts and so on and so forth. And I, I've, I've said many times, and I've seen is, more artsy than it gets credit for. And that's something I said to Jeff when I was in the band and he agreed. I think that's probably most evident on this release we're talking about. That's this forthcoming release. 
man, it is crazy. I, I had a, a college professor in an art course one time and, and he was really insistent on art does not have to be beautiful. Everybody gets this idea that like, if it's beautiful and it's pleasant, it's art. And if it's, you know, jarring and upsetting, it's not, but the jarring and the upsetting is every bit as important, if not more. If not more. Yes. This embodies a, a, upon first listen to this, like, like here's another little peer into my process. You know, when I start to mix and I seen song, I just take the tracks and I put them in my, doll as they call it digital audio workstation which is a fancy word for computer program <laughs> and uh give it a listen you know and, and at first i do have to move this and that up a little bit to hear it all correctly you know but it doesn't take but a second but then i listen to it just one good time and then start to think about where to go with it and the first listen i got that whole effect like jarring like disturbing like put you in the setting. Like we would say, we're talking about the the whole Jim Jones event down in Guyana. Like it, man, it transported my ass there. And I was like, God damn. I was like, I'm kind of scared. Like, this is not cool. Like, I mean, it's a story that I've been interested in my whole life. It happened before I was born. And I've always been kind of like, God, when I would hear the story or watch the documentary about it, it's be real unsettled, but this has this has that same it's the same effect, you know, the imagery from it comes to mind and it's just Lord. Yeah. At the same time, there's still a little bit of that and I seen fun sprinkled in too, you know. <laughs> I don't want to give away any I don't want to do any spoilers, but there there it is, you know. And well, you know, it, I think that, that that humor is like art a lot of times. The darkest, blackest humor is the best. But it's definitely like a punk rock art piece in a way. It's like a, it's weird. It's a, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to spill the beans about it too much. Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. <laughs> I, my reaction was kind of the same way because I didn't have, like, you know, obviously demoed the songs and went through the entire process of putting it together. But it wasn't until the whole thing was spliced together and made into a one a unit, if you will, that I was like, yeah, now I get it. Now I get what they were trying to do with this. And yeah, like it's a, it's unsettling, man. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. But but at the same time, when I say that there's a lot of unsettling musical art that you just like you don't you don't bob your head to, you don't enjoy, you just go like God, you know, like you know, something like metal machine music. I know that Lou Reed was getting out of a shitty contract and flipping the bird to his record company. But at the same time, it's art. I mean, it's noises and sounds. You can sit there and sit through it all. You might not enjoy it in the sense that you enjoy other music, but I mean, it's, it's art. It just is. I'm going to, I'm going to say it right now. I've told this to anybody who will listen. That's my favorite Lou Reed album. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not joking or lying. It's my favorite Lou Reed album. And the reason, one of the reasons why is that I love that minimalist composing style, you know, like his, his mentor, Lamont Young, you know, his, his, his signature piece is a six and a half hour piano concerto that stays in one key the entire time. And I love that. I, I love that. And metal machine music is absolutely consistent with that kind of thing. And it's not the most pleasing thing to hear maybe, but I think it's great. The latest Santa scene record, though, is that and the head bob. Yeah. Like you're going to be jarred. You're going to be like, damn. And it's like, but you're also going to go like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll just leave it at that. We'll give the people something to look forward to when this thing comes out. Um, I'm not exactly sure when it's going to happen. As, as far as I know, everything is in place right now. We got all the tracks from everybody. The cover art's being put together. So it's really, it's just, what is she doing now? I don't, I'm trying to keep this clean. We don't want to know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. I'll just put it to you that way. Okay, but, I mean, that's it, fine. It <laughs> she knows how serious I'm being, trying to be professional and trying to send me off the rails. <laughs> yeah, well, this might be, might actually be perfect timing because I think we've, We've done what we got to do, man. I think yeah, man. Do. I think it's a good time to wrap too. And I've been looking forward to talking about this upcoming release because I mean, it's just, it's just something. It's something special. It's different. It's 
But I, I really do hope people consider it the right way. I hope they don't look at it and go like, man, what does, what does Anacine think they are, man? I don't know, like a name. Hey, you know what? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> hey, one little interesting uh, factoid before we go, though, is when, uh, when you guys were working on it, Barry called me one day and we were just kind of, it was kind of, we talked fairly regularly, but this was kind of, we're getting ready to do something again, talk, you know, and he's like, what, what's your band been up to? And I said, well, I said, uh, we, we're tackling a pretty big thing right now. I said, we're working on a song. It's one song, but it's like seven minutes long. And it's like, really it's three songs jammed into one with one title. And he's like, are you kidding me? And I said, no, <laughs> he said, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> It's like, damn, I had the same idea as those guys without, you know, and now I say the same idea, but it's not, the two songs are not the same. The one I'm talking about is, is Warboy's song, the A Fire in the Void. Mm. It's a a song about being so fed up with life here that you're just going to try to go elsewhere and live. And when I say tired of life here, I mean, on this planet, (laughs) you're going to try to go elsewhere in the universe and live. Cool. which is a fantasy and always will be. I want everybody to know that that's my official opinion, but I like fantasy, but, but yeah, I just thought that was cool. You know, that we kind of was working on similar projects at the same mm-hmm. time. Was just, but I'm looking forward to seeing it out and seeing what, you know, what the art is going to be like and everything. And, and also hearing the before I hang side, because I'm, I'm good friends with, uh, with some of those guys too. Yeah. Uh, really good dudes um, i'm personally like i'm personally really excited for this thing it's it's gonna be good so you mentioned war boys before man give the give the band a plug one more time before we sign off so people know about your uh your current doings yeah the band is war boys us i spent a couple years doing next to nothing after i left and i seen except for working on some man i seen records and um tankified which is a band a kind of a super group it's uh barry hannibal and steve wentzel and myself we have two albums uh, tankified one and tankified two really creative there but the songs are better than that would let on you know they're, <laughs> it's, they're good it's actually I, I will vouch for that tankified's gotten a lot of airplay on my radio show and i only play what's good so yeah Yeah, I'll, I'll toot my horn. That's because other people tooted it to me, so I don't mind. But, but yeah, so, you know, a couple of years after I left in, I started War Boys U.S., and that was my brother's doing mostly. He said, man, come meet the Smallwood brothers. They'll be like your new brothers, and and that's exactly what happened. I mean, I'm, I'm really close to those guys. I love them to death, and we make good music together. And really, it kind of sucks that my brother's about to have to kind of bow out and take on a different role. He's kind of going, I, I, I really would like my brother to do what I did with Anna Seen. You know what I mean? Mm. He's got to leave the band about, but doesn't mean you can't take on a good role. He can. He's, he has art, incredible artistic abilities and, like I said, a good ear. So he can, he's got a role to play if he wants to. But, you know, we're kind of just getting started. We still got a lot of good stuff to come, a lot of songs in the vault. But we have, uh, we started with an album called Hot Brass. It's right off the bat. We, start, we did an album before we even played our first show. Mm. And then we followed up with an EP called Man Alive. And then we followed that up with, we did a German language single. Oh, I never heard that one. Because I, I can speak and understand just a little bit and teamed up with um, Toby Plumenbaum, who's a, a German fan of Anna seen. And we took one of the, we took the song Hot Brass and made a German language uh, version of it and had the idea to do that because some other bands I really like, such as Turbo Negro and Bad Religion had done that. Unfortunately, I've kind of found out that's really kind of unnecessary because like almost the whole country is bilingual. So you can just keep doing songs in English and they're okay yeah, with that. But it's cool. <laughs> but it's it was cool. fun. It was a nice challenge and I enjoyed it. And I actually favor that version more than the other one. Just there you go. the mix is better. And it just, it's just, inter- it's just interesting because I sang in a language that I'm not fluent in. <laughs> and then we did the seven inch that I've been plugging split with the uh, tomcats torpedo band yep. and like i said I've, I've got some people to contact i've got to i got to find out uh the way we can do some things for for tom's family since his passing because they deserve it and he tom would really love it it mean a lot to me you know just 
I just kind of hadn't done it yet because I'm I'm still in a in a bit of a mood about his past and then other other things that I've experienced lately. But mm-hmm. we did that seven inch, and then recently we did a, a digital release. We did a digital single, which is called "A Fire in the Void," and that's like our our song that I was talking about was it's about seven minutes long, which is out of the ordinary for us. But it's kind of got it's got three parts, and it kind of tells a a story as it goes. It's kind of a little reach for us, you know, and it kind of wasn't our number one song we really wanted to do at the time to record and put out, but it kind of made sense. And it was kind of something we felt like it was time to do, you know, it was like time for a kind of a challenge that would push our band up a little bit, but we're still, you know, we're still working on things, even though the the pandemic and my brother's health struggles have got us on a little bit of a a hiatus. It's not a true hiatus because we're still, we're still working. So there's that, there's going to be more to come. It may be a while, but, there's more to come. Well, we shall all be standing by. And thank you for asking me about that because I really didn't plan to talk about it that, but you know, I love talking about what I do, no matter what band it is. The people need to know. And now they do. So yes, everybody check it out. War Boys USA mystery school records is the label out of Wilmington, North Carolina, fine label. And John Bowman, thank you so very much, man. We just we just did four hours in total of super high quality yipping and yapping and yakking and blabbing about your roles with anti scene before, during, and now after. That's pretty cool. Must have been fun because it seemed like forty five minutes to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right on, everybody. Thank you so much. This is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the nutmeg state.